here wants to build a business next? Show of hands. Congratulations, you'll never be able to do that. So that's the first rule I'd like to teach you. You can never build a business to sell. If you build a good business, then everyone will come running to you and want to buy your business. Now, the first thing everyone's going to ask you is, how do you scale a business? Okay, well, first thing, you really have to know what scale means. So, if you have a service business, I have bad news for you, you'll only ever be able to grow it. Now, the problem with service businesses is that fundamentally, whenever you're going to add more service, you need more people. And in South Africa, the margin between what you're going to pay people and what you're going to charge for that is so small that you're just going to keep growing it. So one of the businesses I had previously was a design studio. We did really high-end work. If something was impossible or had a very high media aesthetic and security aesthetic, we were the go-to guys. So if someone just dropped a project a month before it was due after three years of development, we were the guys who fixed it. Probably not the best business model ever. So, you know, if you wanted a website, yeah, we charge you 800,000 grand for four pages. If you wanted a project, we, we, we take on something at you know, 1,000 euros an hour. And here's the problem. One day I woke up and I had to hire staff member number 41, and I realized how much pain temperamental people are, especially talented ones, and we have 41 very talented people, and I summarily sold my business. So, what is a business that scales? The first thing you need to ask yourself is, is it a technology-based business or is it a people-based business? If it's people, it'll grow. If it's technology, it'll scale. Can you sell your business in any country? Is there anything that stops you selling from South Africa to Taiwan to Southwest Tanzania to Latin America? If the answer is nothing is stopping you, congratulations, you've got a scalable business, and now you can start looking for VC and growth equity and all these great things. So what will happen is you will go and pitch, much like you pitched tonight. Anyone want the cheat sheet for pitching? Yes, no, maybe? Okay, here's how it works. No one cares who you are. Every sentence you're gonna say, imagine that the person sitting in front of you is asking you, why should I care? And if you can't answer that, don't say it. Now you're gonna probably wanna to put together a PowerPoint. Okay, you're gonna to have to do that thing. So here's what you're gonna look up. You can look up Guy Kawasaki, 30-20-10 rule. 30 point font, 20 minutes, 10 slides. Except unless you run into a guy called Mark Andreessen. And if you run into Mark Andreessen and have the, the, the fortune to pitch there, well, here's how it's gonna go. And you have until I finish my coffee. So all of a sudden your 30, 20, 10 is actually three, like 33 and 10. So be able to explain what you do very quickly, no more than three minutes ever. That's why the time of tonight was absolutely perfect. Now, if you find yourself in the situation that you're going to present, the other thing you're going to need to know is, can I explain my business in one sentence or at maximum one paragraph? If you don't understand that, you can't build the business strategy around and you can't build the marketing strategy. And you will never be able to bolt that on after the fact. And then there's another thing when you're going about doing this. Just remember that when you finally get to market and you get customer number one, that's only when you become a startup, and that's the only validation that really counts. But you'll learn a very hard lesson. Do you know who knows what customers want? Not experts, and certainly not you. So you're probably going to end up changing that a little bit. But if you get through all this, people are going to offer you some money. And the one thing they're really going to look at is probably not your business plan. Who here has ever made a business plan? Who here, other than CAs or finance types, has ever read a business plan from page one to the end? Exactly nobody. So you don't need one of those. What you really, really need is traction. Customers are the only validation. You can go get a fancy blog to write an article about you, and all five people who read that narcissist's blog will know about your product. And exactly none of them will buy it. So at the end of the day, you still need to figure out uh, how am I going to get customers? And customers are defined as people who pay you money, not users. And that's the next thing you have to figure out. Who are your customers and who are your users? Because also your VC is going to be able to expect you to explain that. And if you can't, well, they're probably not going to part with their money. OK, so you've followed all my bad advice, and you're now at a stage where someone's sitting there, and they want to give you a whole lot of money. You made it, right? I've sat across tables, and guys have said, hey, we're willing to sign a $10 million check. Yay, they love me. Uh, no. Okay, so 
The press doesn't love you, blogs don't love you, and money is not validation. Because guess what? You're not allowed to touch a single cent of that money. That money is growth equity or working capital. In other words, you've got to use that money to get more of the only thing that counts, customers. If you can't do that, well, yeah, they're not going to give you any more money. But if they do give it to you, then it gets really interesting. So here's how it's going to work. You're first going to get something called a seed round. And you're going to think your ideas are worth millions. Sorry, I'm like the kid who killed Christmas. So ideas are worth exactly 0%. Execution of your product is worth 10%. And at that point, you're not really worth anything. Sorry. What's going to happen is you're going to get customers. Customers are the last 90% between you and success. And they also define your value. So again, the only thing they're going to look at is how many customers have you got, how many more customers can you get, and how can we make money of them? So it becomes a very easy set of slides. Slide one is a cliche, get customers. Slide two is get more customers, you're in year two, and start to think about monetizing them. Slide three, or third year, make sure you make lots of money for these clients, because every time you take VC, you have to show a return. And here's how it's going to work. In your seed stage, you'll probably take, let's say, $500,000. Because if you take too little money, you're actually speeding up your own failure. I'll come back to that. Then, in your Series A, you've got some customers, and you prove a point, you're going to take hmm, five to ten million dollars. At best, maybe a hundred million dollars. And you're going to take that money, and guess what? You have to make those guys look really, really good, and like they were really, really smart, because the guys who are going to come in your Series B are really, really conservative. And sure, they'll, they'll, they'll give you $500 million, no problem. But you'll prove to them it's worth it. And then you're going to get round about your Series C, and you're going to try an IPO, because that's the only point at which you get money you can take out of the business. And this is the, trip, the traditional kind of hedonic treadmill that Silicon Valley is going to put you on. We've got a little money, we've got to make a little more money, a little more money, a little more money. It's kind of like a PE ratio on steroids. Except anyone who's done economics will realize that the multipliers make no sense at all. But that's okay, because you've made lots of money, you've IPO, and you know, you're happy. So a lot of things are going to happen between then and now. So the first thing that happens is when you take money, you're going to take board members. Once you have board members, they're going to make sure you do things properly. So you're not going to buy expensive offices, you're not going to buy a fancy car, you're not going to have fancy parties because they will draw that funding faster than you can say, where did my Mercedes go? So that's very important. So really, you've actually got more responsibility now. You don't just have to find customers, you have no choice but to find customers, and you have to find it in the most effective way. You have to show a return so that you can get that next big round, and then a final big round, and then an IPO, and then you get money in your pocket. The other way you can do it is to get working capital. So here's how that works. You don't go the whole, I'm going to IPO for four billion bucks. You don't go the whole, I'm going to build the next social network. And you don't go, I'm going to build the next big mobile app. Because there's two things that BC never wants to hear, social network or mobile app. But that's a separate job. So, let's say you have a good business. Let's say you know what that business can make. Let's say you've validated with some clients. You can take a first round, and there are plenty of big companies who are willing to give you fairly substantial numbers if you're willing to prove that they can make money. And so you'll give away 10, 20, 25%, maybe even 25.1 is a very common number they like, and that's because in South African law they like to have the ability to veto certain decisions. And that's just a matter of them keeping you in check. Remember, the moment you take shareholders, you're taking on more bosses and people that you are way more accountable to, even more than yourself and your own stuff, because they're going to keep the lights on. But if you know that if I take, for example, $10 million, I can take the company up to $21 million a month, and I never have to take another seed round because I'm still entitled to those profits, I can take my share and it can be all very reasonable, you can build a very solid business. Still not done, sadly, so it's not that easy. So the next thing you're going to do is equity can be earned in a couple of ways. So the one way is you can give equity to people in exchange for things like access to marketable skills. But remember, it's like a permanent marriage. It's very hard to get rid of people once you've got them in. So be very careful who you do a deal with and pay very close attention to the contract. G 
generally, whichever party paid more attention to the contract is the one who wins and gets the spoils at the end of that. Also remember that it's a lot like a marriage, except there is no quality time on a Saturday night, which relieves stress. So there's a great Italian saying, you know, love creates stress and releases stress. Yeah, so now you've got stress and money involved. And yeah, that, 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 that gets problematic real fast and tempers fly and everything else comes. And you're going to have to work through it. So once you're in bed with these people, you aren't in bed forever until you exit IPO or die. Um, and the other thing you've got to remember is it's very hard to give money to people. So I've got a business that's making tons and tons of money. Anyone who invests in your business doesn't want to give money to you unless they're buying the whole thing. They want to give money to see it grow so they want to make more money in the long term. So your idea is worth millions in your head, not to a VC. The only thing that's worth money is your customers, your traction, your growth, and how much they can exit it for. So that's the other thing to remember. The moment you take money, you're on a very specific trajectory. Unless you've got someone very nice, like an RMI or something. The nice thing is we all made money for that entire period. And at the end of the day, the third partner, who I still to this day have never met in person, bought the company. And this is a company that's making $40,000 a month for each of us and requiring exactly that much work from me every single month to take up the check. But we also knew if we took money and we offered money from the big guys, we'd never make enough money back. They said, here, we want to grow this, here's $10 million, do you want to do this thing? And we sat down and worked out the numbers before, I mean, it, it's nice, again, it's validation, but just because someone wants to give you money, it's not always a good thing. Money doesn't solve problems, it buys you a better class of enemy, and this is true in every regard. <laughs> And then in other businesses I've been in, well, eventually they took the money. And in another that I was in, we took a bit of leverage capital. And we knew we could deliver, and eventually I was able to sell that business. So think carefully about why you might want money, where you're going to go, what that means. And be very careful who you partner with for that money, because again, money buys a better class of enemy, and that can come in the form of business partners. Now, I've been fairly lucky in four of my businesses, and they're all you know, positive exits, but I've been very unlucky in another business where someone ran off with five million rand. So these things happen. Don't worry, five million is only a lot when you're 22, which I was at the time, not very bright. Still not very bright, but anyway. Um, right, so let's make this a little more interesting. Questions, anything you want. Um, thank you. I just wanted to ask, you know, for most of the entrepreneurs here, yeah, uh, myself included, you know, one of my businesses, I'm at a point where I have somebody who's willing to put money into it, but obviously they own a the percentage of my business, and I've never been in that situation. So, how do I know whether to give them 25% or 30% or 10%? Sure. So, there's a couple of things. I'm just going to shout out. Everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. So it's a very, very good question. How do you value a business? First part, is it a tech business? Is it a non-tech business? If it's a tech business, you get these wonderful imaginary things called multipliers, and you can just go, I'm worth a billion rand. It, it works within a reason. It really does. If you ask anyone who's an economist or CEO, they'll look at valuation and they go, I don't know how they got that money. In every other business, so I had an iClub, I had a design consultancy, I Years and consulted you way more. You can work out how much money your business is worth by simply taking your assets, taking the money from your current revenue, and times it by anything about 18 to 36. Compare that against the current capital that's coming in, and you will get a fairly fair number, which the traditional way counts if you wouldn't value your business. If you've got multipliers, it becomes a problem. So I've got a business currently. We're we're ancient, we're a whole eight months old. And one of the people we can compete against is a bunch of guys called Shopify. They've got 180,000 users. They know that that has a lifetime value of X. And they're worth 3.4 billion. They took six years and 100 million capital to get there. We will have more users than them in the next three months, making us the biggest in the world of what we do. But when we went to the current VCs who I sat with this morning, and who have now said yes, and we went, 
$12.5 million please, they would use. But because they knew this is what it's worth, they knew that we had more uses than the market leader currently in terms of what they took six years to get. And they also knew that we were charging slightly less. And again, don't take more money than you need. This is the first round where we're taking money. And, and as such, we know that I can only go so far with it, and I have to show a return. The bigger return I show for them, the more money I'll get from the next guy. Why do I want the next guy? Well, it's very simple. I'd rather have a very small piece of a woman than all of the grape. So if you are going to take growth capital, make sure you can grow and realize you don't have to own everything. Um, you can make a lot of money. Everybody know who Sergey Brin is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, little company called Google. It's only got 15% of that. And you make somewhere in the region of billion last quarter. Yeah, that's, that's not a terrible way to spend every few months. <laughs> so, yes, it's hard. Yes, giving up that control is hard. Make sure it will grow your business. Make sure it brings you access to market for the capital to complete deals that will gain you growth. If not, being an entrepreneur is hard. It sucks. Any form of help looks attractive. Yeah, all those shiny things aren't always good for you. So it's, it's learning what you want and what you need. I want a new Xbox One. First time I turn it on, I'll be happy. Second time I turn it on, third time, yeah, okay. That's a want. What I really need is to build a strong business and make lots of money and exit and you know, buy a Ferrari, you know, build tropical grapes and some and so on. Is it a want for the money or is it a need? Would it do you good? Would it just you know, make things easier for the world? Because being an entrepreneur is hard. Elon you know, Musk has a great say. About they asked, would you advise people to be an entrepreneur? And he said, well, if you like eating broken glass and staring into the abyss of death, well, there's that. That works. You're going to do this. If you're feeling a little bipolar, that's normal. That's <laughs>
Hi, my name is Hi. So, um, in the case of a tech startup trying to raise seed, um, the seed round basically, but you currently have zero users, but you've got a potential customer, I mean, a potential investor. And then, how do you now evaluate, do an evaluation of your tech startup? Do you evaluate based on how much you need till you get to your next milestone and raise your Series A? Or do you simply benchmark your company against maybe a similar company in your market? So if a similar company at the same stage was valued at 10 million, for instance, which then say mine is also valued as a 10 million valuation pre money. So if you put it in a million bucks, then I'm giving you 10%. And in the case of convertible notes, when that equity or when that convertible notes um, converts, is it converting to common stock or is it preference? Okay, three three questions. So, so let's start with those three. How do you value a tech company at C? Uh, no one knows the answer to that. They make it up as they go along. <laughs> what is the correct way to value my company at C? What do I need to execute well? Becomes a, a, a big problem. Okay, I'll be a little louder. Because that assumes you can execute well. Who here watches pop stars or idols? Ever see a guy who manages to somehow magically rock up on stage and cannot sing, and not one of his friends has stopped him? <laughs> I've seen a story involving Takira and Robert on someone's toes, you know, he's my accountant, and that's equally embarrassing. But people will launch you. They will encourage you, even if you can't sing. It's a problem. Make sure if you're going to make that comparison between you and market leader, that any independent, very honest person can walk up to you, preferably someone's autistic, because they have no filters, have on the tip, and tell you whether or not you're actually competing. Which brings me to another very good point. Do not ever compare yourself to the people around you. Ever. If you're going to do something, do it with the same quality as the best people in the world. So if you fail to reach that, you're certainly better than every single other person you're upon. But you have to be able to make that as a clinical decision. And there's a lot of emotions. Everyone thinks, again, their idea is worth a billion, even though it's worth exactly zero. So, how should you evaluate yourself? How should you convert to notes? Okay, so let's move on to that. So, what, what should your value be? It should be what you can successfully get to a successful execution and secure customer number one, market validation. And the nice thing about market fit, you either feel it or you won't. There is no middle ground. Either people like you or they hate you. And by the way, it will have nothing to do with features. Please, everyone, when you're building a new business, I'm a geek. I'm a geek geek. I can tell you that Mov 21H is the register to reboot a machine. Predictive mode assembly language is something you should never have to understand. However, if you gave me two million grand right now, I will spend one nine 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 on my tech and one in marketing. Bad idea. One on the tech, the rest on marketing. Because again, customers are the only traction that's gonna matter. How much should you should you take? You should take enough to get you lots and lots of customers. On your seed round, you are gonna take a big hit in terms of equity. If someone's taking the highest level of risk, your idea to X customers, you're going to end up parting with 40% or around there. Because right now, sadly, it's an idea, and everybody, what are ideas worth? Zero. Execution is worth something, 10% uh, of your total success, and everything else is about how many customers you have and are they paying you money. This is also why you should avoid freemium models if you don't want to scare VCs away. Freemium models attract people who will never be customers. Don't do it. Convertible notes, okay. So a convertible note basically works like this. Someone will give you a whole pile of money, and if in a year or whatever period they specify, it will convert to stock. Whatever stock that converts to is entirely up to you and what you're willing to ask for. Let's go back to the story of me undercharging as a poor web designer. The only difference between me and the other people was being willing to ask. What you don't ask, you won't get. The worst thing they can say is no, and that's not always a bad thing either. There are plenty of people who give you money if it is really worth what it is. You will also probably find out really quickly that it isn't. Again, if you say the word social network or that I've got an app, good luck. Okay, um, 
do you do mentoring and or coaching? And would you terribly mind if I just bought you coffee for 30 minutes on any Saturday Sunday? Okay, so very cool power tip here. He did it right. When you ask for a mentor, it's about their time. If they're willing, you pay for coffee, everything else. So my answer is absolutely yes, and yes, I do. Um, separately, while you're doing this, do yourself a favor, read the pamphlet called The Lean Startup. I call it a pamphlet because it is really, really small. Read Peter Thiel zero, uh, 1 to 0, and uh, read the hard thing about hard things. Um, build your product. Don't spend all your time and money on your product. People believe in, in that features are what sells. Mm -hmm. Who should I pick on today? I'm going to pick on you because you're lovely and in the front row. What type of phone do you have? IPhone. You've got an iPhone. Fantastic. Can you tell me all the features of your phone? <laughs> no. Nobody can. So if I go to an ice cream store and I want to buy ice cream and have ice cream, I will buy ice cream. If I want to go to an ice cream store and they're out of sprinkles, probably still buy ice cream. But if they go and they only have sprinkles, I won't be buying ice cream. Features are sprinkles. People will never, ever, ever, ever buy anything you have because of features you have. You will solve one problem and you will match one price point and you will find market fit and that is it. So don't spend two years buying your product, building a product. From idea stage to execution, complete to market with customer one is six months. If you take longer than that, people won't give you money because they know you're obsessed with features. Features don't sell. Guess what? All the geeks, you can lynch me later for this, your tech is completely unimportant. It has no value. It enables a business. That cool stack, that amazing UX tweak you did, Nada. What I want to see is how much are you going to get in the bottom line? How much are you going to make every month? What is your gross profit margin? If you're a tech business and it's less than 90%, you're doing something very, very, very wrong. Well. The worst margin I've ever had in a business is 96%. And, and yeah. So, so bear that in mind as well. Guess what? Not about Mother Teresa, not about your cool tech, not about anything. I'm funding you because I want money. You're going to make me money. You, you've got to work. I'm in that street corner now. Pump hand is strong, but that's a VC. That's all they care about. They're powdering up that hand while they're bashing you up and talking to you. And again, giving you money isn't validation. Giving you money is, is you're not going to work even harder than you're already working. And uh, yeah, I see lots of tired people with gray hair and who are working a million hours, seven days a week, and have no concept of work balance. Congratulations. Welcome to being an entrepreneur. The bipolar thing is normal. I'm here all week. Next question. Yes. Question? Okay. Let's give Craig a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some real stuff there. Yeah. Okay. Before, before we announce who the winning pitch is for the evening,